We have just examined two potential interpretations which suggest that failure for irregular armed forces to meet the condition of distinction under the third Geneva Convention entails civilian status. We have seen the shortcomings of this approach. It therefore seems that the most convincing approach is that in order to be qualified as armed forces for the purposes of targeting, forces must only meet two general conditions, organization and belonging to a state party. The condition of distinction, which is necessary for an individual to qualify for a combatant status, does not play any role with respect to the law of targeting, if that individual belongs to state armed forces. However, we must now examine the question of who is a member of state armed forces and can be targeted at any time as long as he or she is a member of those forces. Membership in state armed forces is quite clear with respect to regular state armed forces. As you have already seen in Chapter 4, membership in state armed forces is determined by national law and based on a formal integration into permanent units, distinguishable by uniforms, insignia and equipment. Membership is much more problematic with respect to state irregular armed forces. What is the test for such membership? It is not clear whether that test is the same as the one for membership in irregular armed forces for the purpose of the entitlement of prisoners of war status. In any case, regarding the law of targeting, the RCRC has proposed that the test should be the same as the one for membership in armed groups, that is, the continuous combat function test. The advantages and disadvantages of this test with respect to irregular armed forces are generally the same as those concerning armed groups, which we have already discussed. However, some criticisms on the RCRC test deserve a particular attention when considered in relation to irregular armed forces. As we have seen, the adoption by the RCRC of the continuous combat function test is mainly justified on the assumption that, in most cases, affiliation to armed forces is only straightforward with respect to regular state armed forces. In other cases, affiliation is not clear and there is therefore a risk for civilians to be targeted in error. However, this justification is irrelevant for members of irregular armed forces who fulfill the condition of distinction under the third Geneva Convention. For example, by wearing a uniform. Uncertainty would be limited to irregular combatants who do not respect the condition of distinction. The variety of practices begs the question as to whether a flexible approach may be more suitable. We could then envisage, as we did with respect to armed groups, an organic membership approach with respect to irregular armed forces that fulfill the conditions of distinction by wearing uniform or a fixed distinctive sign, and on the other side, a continuous combat function approach with respect to irregular armed forces that do not. It is true that then members of irregular armed forces who would not distinguish themselves from the civilian population would be better protected than the others, since they could only be targeted as members of those forces if they have a continuous combat function. It is nonetheless doubtful whether it is an incentive for not respecting the condition of distinction. Indeed, in an international armed conflict, the advantage arising from greater protection from targeting are offset 
by the consequences of failing to respect the condition established by the Third Geneva Convention. Contrary to the situation in non-international armed conflicts, members of such a forces would indeed be seriously sanctioned by losing the status of combatant and prisoners of war.